Hi, it's Kat here, otherwise known as the Creative Introvert, and today I'm going to be talking about Vincent van Gogh's chart. So um, I think we should start with a little note on the pronunciation because it's something I struggle with. Apparently it's not van Gogh or van Gogh. It's Vincent Willem van Gogh. So yeah, I can only do my best as an English speaker. <laughs> so diving straight in, um, I'm going to start by talking about van Gogh's uh, personality. And we can actually say a fair amount about his personality because he left so many of these letters he wrote to his brother, Theo, who actually kept all of his brother's letters, uh, though Van Gogh only kept like, uh, actually didn't, didn't keep any of Theo's letters, um, which is sad. Anyway, um, he was arguably quite a difficult character um, in that he did, he seemed to mean well, but he clashed with a lot of people. Um, there are records about these conflicts that he had with his professors. For example, there's a story about his, um, a conflict with, which he had with Eugene the Seabird, his, his drawing teacher, when Van Gogh was required to draw the Venus of Milo uh, during one of the drawing classes. He produced the limbless naked torso of a Flemish peasant woman. Um, instead of this, this statue, and, and Siebert regarded this as a defiance against his artistic guidance and made corrections to Van Gogh's drawing with this crayon so vigorously that he tore the paper. Um, Van Gogh then flew into a violent rage, I, I would argue understandably, um, and shouted at Siebert, you clearly do not know what a young woman is like, goddammit! And uh, this fieryness, I mean, we could point to the sun in Aries for this, where the sun is exalted, um, but also could be bridging on um, arrogance uh, and maybe gets a bit carried away with itself at times. He also had conflicts with his friends. Uh, so when Gauguin agreed to visit uh, him in Arles in 1888, Van Gogh hoped for friendship um, and he really wanted to make this artist's collective happen. And while he was waiting, um, he actually painted sunflowers, which, well, he painted like several paintings of sunflowers for um, Gauguin, which I think is sweet. Uh, so obviously Van Gogh had like this, this sweet sentimental side to him, um, but it wasn't without rage. And it was this uh, particular visit, which we point to uh, that led to um, Van Gogh's own like self mutilation of his ear. So he cut, cut off like pretty much all of his ear. I think he left the lobe. Um, and this happened, we, we think, because he was scared that Gauguin was leaving. Um, and yeah, their relationship was very complex. Um, but anyway, I'll talk a bit more about his uh, relationships in a little bit. Um, I'm going to focus now on the first house. So Van Gogh is a cancer rising, um, which means that the domicile ruler or the steward of cancer is, is the moon. Uh, and you can see that the moon is in the sixth house in Sagittarius. Um, this isn't the best place for the domicile lord to be because it's in aversion to the first house. Uh, that angle of sight in, in traditional astrology isn't really counted. Um, it's, it's as if it, it's somebody who's um, unable to check up. They're away from home and they're unable to check up on their home. Maybe they've leased out their home to some students who are wrecking it uh, and it's, it's just not a good position for the, the moon to be in. Um, some people would um, maybe describe this as uh, someone who doesn't have like a full grip on first house matters. Uh, that first house was referred to as the helm um, by the ancient astrologers and like the helm of the ship, that's where you do the steering. And if you have a well-placed um, domicile steward or lord, uh, it's going to be able to do its job at steering the ship a lot more effectively. Um, and the ship that I'm referring to is, is the first house matters. So your body, your personality, your psychology, your health, uh, and like I said, the moon can't really do that so effectively here. So in that way, I can see how particularly his emotions maybe um, aren't really fully within his control um, if we associate the moon with, with emotions in particular and the way he relates to people. So moving on to his career, um, and this is really where the, uh, the 10th house is going to be looked at, but that, that sun in Aries um, is definitely, well, it's definitely steering this ship. So uh, Van Gogh, even though he was not successful, um, objectively not su successful in his own life um, when it came to selling his art, we know that things carried on after his death. 
and his work ultimately did uh, get become very well known. And um, I've heard from Chris Brennan that there is uh, there is something in the chart to say this when it comes to zodiacal releasing. This is a little bit beyond me, so I'm not going to get into it today. But uh, it's it's all there basically. But one thing I will say about what he was like in his life is that he was highly ambitious and incredibly driven. I mean, he was prolific in the art works that he produced, both oil paintings and drawings and, and sketches. Um, and there are lots of interesting quotes that I've, I've come across that reflected uh, that uh, really determined Sun and Aries. For example, if one has fire in one and soul, one can't keep stifling them and one would rather burn than suffocate. What's inside must get out. And I've heard the 10th house being described as that thing that we can't resist. Um, it, it drives us rather than us driving it. Um, it's, it's really like exactly what Van Gogh expressed there. What's inside must get out. He was compelled to make art. And certainly in his letters, you do see kind of hints at arrogance. Um, it was almost like, well, he had these manic faces. He has since been um, kind of like post-diagnosed with um, bipolar disorder. And I feel like when he was in those manic periods, um, he was a lot more cocksure about himself. And arguably, maybe without this, these periods of, of the brightness of, of the sun and Aries, um, he would have given up, um, especially with everything else in his life, which on paper isn't, isn't great. Um, but clearly he had this um, fire inside him that wouldn't let him stop, which was good for us. Um, and I will just mention uh, the sixth house here because this naturally relates to the 10th house. There's always a trine between the 10th house and the sixth house. And he does have that moon and Jupiter in the sixth. Um, and it's interesting to see how, uh, how he expressed his, uh, his viewpoint on, on labor itself. So the sixth house, um, can represent the kind of, well, it used to represent slaves, but let's translate that into like modern day speak. And it's, it's just like the work that we do, which is like the hard graft, um, it's labor. So uh, he said many different things, which kind of express this view. Um, like for example, the way he saw arts, he didn't really see it that romantically. He saw it as, as work. Uh, he said, painting is just a good, as good a profession by which to earn a living as, for example, smith or doctor. An artist, in any case, is the exact opposite of someone living a life of leisure. If one wants to draw a parallel, then either a smith or a doctor corresponds more closely. Yeah, so, so for him, art wasn't this like leisure, leisure activity. It wasn't a fifth house matter, basically. It was clearly a sixth house matter for him. He said that the daily work is a thing that doesn't change and becoming absorbed in that isn't as dangerous as looking at the unfathomable. Uh, and this is actually tying in his, his ninth house beliefs. So when he speaks about the unfathomable, um, it, it looks like he was talking about God. And um, this is going to come up a bit, a lot <laughs> later, uh, which I'll get into. Um, but the thing I took from that quote is this idea of it being a, a daily thing that doesn't change. That's a sixth house thing, something that you do um, daily, the, the daily grind. Oh, and, and to kind of showcase his, uh, his own, like maybe self-optimism. While I'm working, I feel an unlimited confidence in art and that I'll succeed. But on days of physical exhaustion or when there are financial obstacles, I feel that faith less and am overcome by doubt, which I try to get over by immediately setting to work. Yeah, so he was um, really driven. I think that's, that's safe to say. Moving on to the seventh house, uh, relationships. So we associate the seventh house with other things, but relationships is, is one thing. And um, the seventh house is coincided with uh, Capricorn, which is Saturn's domicile and Saturn is in Taurus in the 11th house. Um, and something else that's worth pointing to is that Venus, which could also represent um, at least women, um, relationships with women in, in his life. Uh, and it's also worth looking at Venus because She's the Lord of um, Taurus. So anyway, but I think it's important to say that Venus is afflicted. It's conjunct Mars. And just to kind of make it worse, um, Van Gogh has a day chart. So Mars is going to be more difficult. And again, probably the source of a lot of his um, difficulties, particularly in relationships. 
uh, when he was 20, like, so there are lots of different kind of depressing stories surrounding Vincent and relationships or wanting to have a relationship. When he was 20 and in London, he became infatuated with his landlady's daughter, uh, Eugenie Lawyer, but he was rejected after confessing his feelings. Um, and after this point, he actually became a lot more isolated and religiously fervent. So maybe tapping into that, that ninth house, um, Venus Mars issue there. When he was living with his parents in 1881, um, his recently widowed cousin, Cornelia Key Bostricker, uh, she arrived for a visit and he was thrilled and, you know, really got to know her, fell in love with her and proposed marriage, uh, which she refused. And by saying the words, no, nay, never. Yeah. So she was, um, he was, he was pretty, pretty sad about this. Uh, and Key's father made it clear that the refusal should be, you know, paid attention to um and and respected and that the two would never marry largely because of van gogh's inability to support himself um maybe that that inability to support yourself that could be a lot to do with that moon in the sixth house as well and uh another woman who uh, was nicknamed cn um he met towards the end of january 1882 um she had a five-year-old daughter and was pregnant and when Van Gogh's father discovered the details of the relationship, he put pressure on his son to abandon Sien and her two children. Um, and Vincent at first defied him and considered even, you know, kind of escaping with the family. But ultimately, in 1883, he did leave Sien. Sien actually ended up killing herself, I, I believe. Uh, so another ridiculously sad story. And last awful story is August 1884. Um, he met Margot Bergman, Bergman, uh, a neighbor's daughter who was 10 years older than him. And, uh, they fell in love and they wanted to marry, but neither of their families were in favor of this. Um, and when this kind of came to pass, um, uh, Margot was devastated and took an overdose of something called strychnine. Um, probably not saying that right. Uh, but she did survive after Van Gogh rushed her to a nearby hospital so just a lot of um unavoidable tragedies and separations mars so moving on to the fourth house his roots and the fourth house here is coincided with libra venus's domicile and art was definitely in his family um if we associate venus with art that's where i'm getting that from three of his un uncles were art dealers his brother was an art dealer theo his father, however, was a minister of the Dutch Reformed Church. And, and you know, Venus um, is in the ninth house. So if Venus was representing um, the father at all, uh, we, we do find her in the ninth house, which does represent religion. Uh, and Van Gogh's mother, Anna, was very rig uh, rigid and also religious, um, who emphasised the importance of family to the point of claustrophobia of those around her. So not a good relationship with his mother um maybe that's the afflicted with with either his parents ultimately but maybe that's the afflicted venus um also the moon uh which can represent the mother in the sixth house uh, not the best house so moving on to his creative work his art uh we're going to look at the fifth house fifth house coincides with scorpio and mars scorpio's ruler is in pisces in the ninth house and this is the difficult mars we we've, we've kind of touched on and while venus being conjunct with mars doesn't seem to help venus i think mars being conjunct with venus helps mars um in that it may have led him to almost express his creativity um this this martian creative energy um through his art which is i mean i think beautiful um, and it's interesting to know how his work um changed from going from pretty dark, uh, at least just dark in tone, um, particularly around the time um, of his Saturn return uh, and maybe a bit before, but after this, some of his best work, um, in my opinion anyway, seems to come after this and it starts to brighten up. Um, he believed that the effect of color went beyond the descriptive. He said that color expresses something in itself. Um, and he really tied emotions in with color in a big way uh, and his emotional state, um, sorry, not his emotional state, his psychological state was really tied in with color. Um, yellow meant a lot to him. And this was because to him, it symbolized emotional truth. Uh, 
uh, and he used it as a symbol for sunlight and for God. And again, that ruler of the uh, fifth house being in the ninth house, uh, a lot of his work does come from this religious perspective or um, this this strong faith that he had, um, which you know was very different to his father's faith. But um, he kind of he kind of seemed to have this idea of a, a very universal sense of the divine um, that was the same thing as art. It was the same thing as nature to him. It was all um, one thing. And he seemed to try to express this. His paintings of flowers are filled with symbolism, but rather than use traditional Christian iconography, he made them his own. Um, this idea that life is lived under the sun and work being this allegory for life. And he had a lot of interesting influences. Um, in 1885 in Antwerp, he had become interested in Japanese yukioi woodblock prints. Um, and he used them to decorate his walls. Um, and in Paris, he collected hundreds of them. And it was kind of like a, a trend at the time. A lot of people were taking inspiration from uh, Japanese culture then, uh, just like now. Uh, and he said, I envy the Japanese the extreme clarity that everything in their work has. It's never dull and never appears to be done too hastily. Their work is as simple as breathing and they do a figure with a few confident strokes with the same ease as if it were as simple as buttoning your waistcoat. Uh, location also seemed to make a big difference for him. It, it did seem to influence his work. So at the time he was in Arles uh, became one of his most prolific periods. He completed 200 paintings and more than 100 drawings and watercolours. Uh, he was enchanted by the local countryside and the light there and his works in this period became really bright so that yellow we start to see a lot of ultramarine and mauve. Uh, my favorite work was done when he was in Arles um, in the Saint, Rem uh, Re Saint Remy uh, Asylum and some of his works from this time were characterized by those swirls which I think most people uh, associate Van Gogh with um, such as the Starry Night um, and he, he was allowed these short supervised walks and that's when he would paint those cypress trees, olive trees, um, and there are lots of paintings which document this. Between February and April 1890, um, he suffered another mental health relapse. When he was super depressed, uh, he was unable to write, but he was still able to paint and draw during these times and um, kind of expressed that this is what like, saved him in these times. And one of the paintings produced in this time was uh, Sorrowing Old Man or At Eternity's Gate, which is one of the saddest paintings I think that he produced and maybe anyone ever produced. And even though he's kind of really suffering at this time when he was in the asylum, uh, again, some of his best works were produced from this period. So I think it's worth uh, focusing on the moon for a little bit. It's the lovely moon he painted. Uh, I think it's interesting things like you know, we've got a great example here of, of somebody with a, you know, a moon who isn't really in a great position um, and how this affected his life. And it did affect him in a big way. Um, for example, he, he, he did seem to want children and he did kind of have periods in his life where he was maybe taking care of other people's children or around other people's children. Um, and cancer itself is associated with having lots of children. And I assume if the moon was in a better position, he would have, but it never happened for him. Uh, and maybe that's partly because his life did get cut short, but also because, like I said, the moon isn't in a great place. Um, the moon being in Sagittarius. So the moon is actually associated with travel as well as Sagittarius, um, both of them. Uh, and he was fond of travel. He lived in many different places. And I think from the age of 11, he wasn't in one place for more than a few years. Um, there's a site which kind of documents all of the places that he um, lived and worked in his life. And he moved around a lot. Optimism. So I kind of mentioned optimism in the sense of how he was optimistic about his career, but I just think he also had a general sense that ultimately things would be okay. Uh, and I think that's that Sagittarian vibe of, you know, when you think about Sagittarius season, it's, it's the darkest time of the year um, and light is still declining. And yet there is this denial of that fact that there is that we're always boosted by that Jupiterian optimism. Uh, that's why we have Christmas then, well, maybe not why, but it, it coincides with Christmas, the festival of lights, um, this denial of the dark. Uh, and I think there were many times when 
Van Gogh probably was in Denial of the Dark. It's almost like um, Aries is the will to power, but Sagittarius, I'm just going to call it Sag, uh, Sagittarius is the faith in things working out. Um, and unfortunately, he had both and they kind of kept him going maybe for as long as they could. So uh, moving on to his health, uh, which is also where the moon it sits in the place in his chart, which is associated with um, bad health, health problems. And with Sagittarius there, we, it's hard not to think about overindulgences, excesses, um, kind of like not caring for our bodies and this leading to bad health, um, some kind of addictive or careless habit contributing to bad health. Um, I think, I'm not even sure if he had syphilis, but people kind of claim he did. Um, one thing we, we were pretty sure is that he was, um, he did have bipolar disorder. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, this could have something to do with the moon not kind of being in, having its full reins on his first house, his, his own mind, his own body. He would also kind of swing to extremes. So uh, at one time when he was in, I think this was in England, but he was, he was really down. He was taking unpaid work as a supply teacher in this small boarding school. Um, and according to his flatmate at the time, um, he ate very frugally, avoiding meat, um, and he was really, really religious in, in this stage. And he went through these phases and, uh, I, I feel like that moon in the sixth house can often represent periods, um, of excess and periods of, uh, asceticism. So, um, living really frugally and not caring for himself. Uh, he lived in poverty. He ate poorly, um, and this was when he was in Antwerp, he would spend all of his money basically on art materials and art models, uh, people to draw. Apparently bread, coffee and tobacco became his staple diet. Sounds a bit like my life as a student. And in February 1886, he wrote to Theo saying that he could only remember eating six hot meals since the previous year in May. Um, his, he had problems with his teeth. Maybe that was to do with Saturn. Saturn can be associated with uh, teeth. Um, and he drank heavily and he was hospitalized, hospitalized between February and March 1886. Um, and this is where we think he was treated for syphilis, but we don't have hard evidence of that. And just generally, he was pretty much always ill, run down and overworked. So this is something that I also found out that he um, he, he just spent all of his time painting um, and he kind of had this real respect of just hard work and labor uh, and couldn't really himself away from that at the detriment of his body flipping up to the ninth house and going back to his faith so van gogh was certainly religious and like i said his his views did change over time um he had this christian upbringing his father was a protestant minister and vincent did initially want to follow in his father's footsteps but he soon realized that again they had different beliefs and van gogh just really struggled when it came to um studying theology um, and studying to become a preacher. There were these entrance exams in Greek and Latin and math, and he just found that too much. You know, he was, he was an artist. And when he was working in the kind of religious field, he took up this post as a missionary. This is in this coal mining district. And he, he I guess he wanted to show support for the very poor congregation and he did this by um, giving up his comfortable lodgings at this bakery to a homeless person and moved into a small hut where he slept on straw you know to me that sounds like well an incredibly selfless amazing thing of him to do but uh, apparently his squalid living conditions didn't endear him to the church uh, who dismissed him for undermining the undermining the dignity of the priesthood so this is just an example of one of many of like his idea of religion just not conforming to what other people's at the time were um and again in august 1879 he moved to a town called quesmes i kind of wish i hadn't said tried to say that anyway he, he, he moved there to preach without pay um and the residents did appreciate his humanitarian missionary work but he did fail as a preacher because he lacked eloquence as a speaker um, and his sermons were often convoluted and confusing to the congregation, which I hope this is not. So wrapping up with his death on July 27th, 1890, he was aged 31, 
and he shot himself in the chest with a seven millimeter revolver. There were no witnesses um, and he died about 30 hours later. And if you've seen the film, I think it's just called Vincent, which I'll link to in the description below. I'll link to a trailer of it. Um, there, are, there are people who suspect that he didn't commit suicide. He, uh, he was murdered. I don't think it's a widely held belief, but it's it's really interesting, and I'd recommend the film either way. And and people do point to his very unstable mental health condition at the time, so they're like, well, of course he killed himself, but you know we don't know. There were no eyewitnesses. Anyway, um, because uh, there was no surgeon around, um, ultimately the bullet couldn't be removed, and um, his brother Theo um, was at his side when he died. And apparently he was in good spirits uh, just before um, his last words, which were, the sadness will last forever. So I hope you enjoyed that, um, found it as interesting as I did. I find um, Van Gogh's life really fascinating, um, just like his artwork. Um, I strongly recommend checking out the letters that he wrote to Theo. Uh, they're really, um, yeah, he was, he was an amazing writer. It's like reading journals. And also, if you'd like to book an astrology reading with me, we can do something just like I did for Vincent, um, but with your chart. I just need your date of birth, your time of birth, and your location, and we can discuss your creativity, your career, relationships, health, all of the things. Just visit thecreativeintrovert.com slash astrology, and you'll find more information there. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.